in places, especially in the east. Sleet or snow possible across the southeast at first, staying cold with areas of freezing fog which will slowly lift into low cloud. It'll be dry across Wales with some sunny spells, eastern areas subject to more cloud and areas of freezing fog, feeling cold with low temperatures. A cold and cloudy day again with areas of freezing fog for most across the Midlands. A few wintry flurries are possible at first, feeling cold with temperatures struggling into low single figures. Across northern England, it's another cold but largely dry day. However, areas of mist and freezing fog persisting into the afternoon. An isolated chance of a few wintry showers skirting along the eastern coasts. It's dry and cold across much of Scotland, perhaps with a few coastal showers, chiefly in the north, continuing to feel cold despite any sunshine, with temperatures at or just below freezing. And a cold and frosty start across Northern Ireland with patches of freezing fog lifting into low cloud during the morning, skies brightening up the sun with temperatures struggling into low single figures. And that is how your weather is shaping up for the rest of your Monday. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fungary debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
GDP figures out this morning chart the United Kingdom on course for recession. But is the latest month's news a little bit of good news? That and, of course, we're exploring the United Kingdom trade deals with Australia and New Zealand to be discussed in Parliament later today. Voter IDs on the menu as well. And that Trojan horse scandal in Birmingham. What really happened? Stick with us here on The Briefing to explore it all. Good morning, it's 9.31. I'm Tamsin Roberts in the GB Newsroom. Four children are critically ill in hospital after being rescued from an icy lake in Solihull. Police say the children were in cardiac arrest when they came out of the water at Babs Mill Park in Kingshurst yesterday afternoon. Reports from the scene found that the children had been playing on the ice and fell through. West Midlands Fire Service says they were told up to six people had gone into the water. The search of the lake has continued through the night for anyone else who may have fallen in. Yellow warnings of ice, fog and snow are still in place for much of the UK, causing widespread travel disruption. There are delays across the railways with southeastern trains telling people not to travel. Gatwick and Stansted airports have reopened after closing their runways yesterday. Delays to flights across all UK airports are to be expected today. The Met Office says overnight frost is expected until Friday. Britain's economy grew between September and October, but has still shrunk over the last three months. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show a 0.5% increase in GDP in the month. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves says the numbers underline the government's failure to grow the economy. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has warned there is a tough road ahead. These figures confirm that this is a very challenging economic situation here and across the world and it will get worse before it gets better. But we have a plan that will more than halve inflation over the next year and if we stay the course we can get back to the strong economic growth that we need. Government ministers are holding an emergency COBRA meeting later in a bid to minimise disruption from ongoing public sector strikes. Military and civil servants are being trained in case they need to step in for airport staff as they prepare to strike for eight days from the 23rd to New Year's. Armed forces will be deployed to hospital trusts as ambulance staff, nurses and paramedics walk out later this month. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to the briefing with Tom Harwood. Good morning, it's 9.33 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Now, first this morning, Britain's economy grew by 0.5% between September and October. This is in a rebound from a 0.6% contraction over the previous month. Over the last three months as a whole, the economy fell by 0.3%, putting us on course for recession. Well, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has warned that there are tough times still ahead for the United Kingdom. These figures confirm that this is a very challenging economic situation here and across the world. And it will get worse before it gets better. But we have a plan that will more than halve inflation over the next year. And if we stay the course, we can get back to the strong economic growth that we need. Well, the Chancellor speaking there. Let's dive into the detail now with our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan. And Liam... How much trust can we place in these individual month-by-month -month figures? Well, monthly figures are subject to huge revision. Um, and also, it's a good story that GDP went up a little bit in October, but I'm afraid it's a bit of a statistical um, hoax in the sense that uh, no-one's doing anything wrong at the Office for National Statistics. Mm. It's just that in September, because of Her Majesty's unfortunate death and the funeral mm. and um, a number of unplanned, irregular bank holidays, if you like, mm. one-off bank holidays, of course, rightly uh, granted by the government because of the tragedy of Queen Elizabeth II dying. That meant that GDP, all economic activity, was artificially lower in September, mm. which means it just went back to where it was. So it was a bit of a bounce-back effect rather than anything... It was a bounce-back effect. 
The bigger story, Tom, I'm afraid, is that August, September, October, those three months compared to the same three-month period uh, in 2021, the economy was smaller. As you rightly said in your introduction, that means we're on course for a recession. A recession is two successive quarters mm. of economic contraction. And it looks as if the economy has slowed November, December and into January as well, not least because of strike action, industrial production numbers mm. that we've got are flat, manufacturing we know specifically is in its worst situation since the depths of lockdown in, in 2020. The good news is that unemployment is still quite low and there are signs that inflation is falling. We'll learn more about that uh, on Wednesday when the inflation figures come out. But if we're looking to that technical definition of recession, two quarters of negative economic growth, the United States of America is already there. Yep. Some European countries are already there. Yep. Looking at the strike action particularly that's taking place this week and next, that's going to push us there. It's worth saying that what's happening in the UK, we are not an outlier at all. Our rate of inflation is actually lower than the Eurozone average, believe it or not, this year, 2022, partly because of our strong bounce back in the first part of this year. Uh, we're still on course to be the fastest growing economy in the G7. It's not a high bar, but <laughs> I, give it, I give you that as a little bit of good news mm. on not a particularly nice morning, not least because of uh, strikes. We've got train strikes kicking in tomorrow. We've got postal strikes, of course. We've got uh, nurses' strikes coming down the, 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 the track, if you like. And what happens is this slows down economic activity and almost makes the recession inevitable, even if it wasn't before. I think what's quite interesting, Tom, politically, just for a moment, mm. is that Labour knows that it's the country sees them as umbilically linked to the unions. The unions provide a third of their votes on their ruling National Economic Council, National Executive Committee, uh, half the delegates for party conferences and, of course, millions of pounds each year. But I'm seeing signs, and maybe you are too, of some people in Labour trying to distance themselves more and more from the trade unions as mm. the public begins to lose patience. We've got multiple strikes across multiple sectors until Christmas and beyond. In particular... Wes Streeting very much tipped as a leader of the future. Mm. Health sec Shadow Health Secretary complaining that why should the doctors get 26% pay rise, mm. which they're going to strike over when so few people can see, yeah. when so many people have problems getting hold of a doctor. He's presenting himself as a patient's champion rather than the representative of the trade unions within the NHS. Lord Bunk Blunkett as well in the Daily, Daily Express over the weekend saying similar things, that these extensive waves of strike action, mm. of course it's terrible for the government, of yeah. course it's going to damage the government, but the longer it goes on, if Labour don't get in there and criticise the unions, then it could backfire on the opposition as really well. Really interesting to see that positioning, one to watch very closely. But for now, Liam Halligan, thank you for joining us this morning on The Briefing and that, uh, well, slightly mixed economic picture that we're seeing. But next, and relatedly this morning, the Secretary of State for Trade, Kemi Badenoch, is set to bring the Australia-New Zealand bill before Parliament later today. This is all about those trade deals, of course. Last month, the former Environment Secretary, George Eustace, called the deal uh, a failure. It was, it was, of course, the first uh, deal to be uh, written from scratch after Brexit. But dairy farmers, who uh, last week saw their first batches of product arrive in Australia seem to be happy enough. What's the real detail behind this deal? Well, I'm delighted to be joined by Matthew Lesh, the head of public policy at the Institute for Economic Affairs. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, Matthew, Very first, first of all, um, George Eustace says that this is a failure for the United Kingdom. It lets in too many cheap goods from overseas. Is that a failure? Quite frankly, George Eustace is completely and utterly wrong uh, in his comments about the Australia-UK trade deal. Uh, the point of a trade deal is to open up trade, to enable goods and services to more freely move between Australia and the UK. And in that sense, the Australia-UK trade deal is a huge success. It's great for British consumers who will be able to have access to, uh, over time, over a 15-year uh, period, uh, cheaper meat um, from beef, from sheep, as well as more immediate access to cheaper goods uh, and, and more market access to Australia. It's great for also for British producers. We shouldn't forget that this was a comprehensive 
uh, free trade deal in the sense that it removed tariffs on all goods. That means moving tariffs on uh, exports of British Scottish whiskey or uh, Land Rover cars into Australia. So I think it's quite ridiculous. The problem is with Eustace is he, he's taking what, what we'd call a mercantilist view, which is a very producer focused um, perspective on this, where it's apparently bad for British farmers to face fair competition with Australian farmers, and then he's greatly exaggerating the potential impact. Most of Australia's exports of agriculture go to the Asia-Pacific region. Australia, al although it will have a positive economic impact, we shouldn't exaggerate the amount that's going to be put on ships and sent over to the UK. So I think on, on the margins, great for British consumers. It's not going to end the British agricultural industry. Uh, and e even so, the, the whole point of trade is to open things up, not to shut things down. Now, Matthew Lesh, people watching and listening to this interview might uh, have noticed that you've got a slight accent, might have noticed that you indeed come from Australia originally. Are you not just batting for the Australian team here? Is it not <laughs> a concession to say that the United Kingdom might accept more Australian goods into our markets? I don't think it is a concession. It, it's not a concession to give your uh, consumers access to more goods. I think that's that's great. If anything, it's terrible for Australian consumers that uh, more products are going to be exported to the UK. I think the problem is uh, with trade deals is they're negotiated as legal texts by lawyers and they're always framed as winners and losers when that's complete nonsense. The, the, the great thing about trade is that it's mutually beneficial. Um, it's great for my countrymen in, in Australia that they're able to export a bit more, to specialise, to be more competitive, more innovative. It's great for British consumers. It's great for me as someone who lives in the UK, having more access to Australian goods over here, as well as uh, British producers being able to send things over. This is, this is the problem is we have this mindset, I think, that things there have to be somebody loses, have to, somebody has to win. But I don't think that's the case with trade at all. And there's another element of this trade deal that hasn't got much media coverage at all, and that's the sort of mobility element of it. People under the age of 35 will, for a period of three years, have unrestricted access to move between Australia and the United Kingdom. Uh, it seems that this is a, an incredibly positive thing, particularly as these two countries have similar levels of GDP per capita. You're not going to have a, a massive one-way flow in the way that we saw with European free movement. Could this be a model for future trade deals for similarly developed countries to really allow that sort of uh, 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 benefit, particularly for young people? Mm, yeah, I think you're right, Tom. This was a, a huge, actually, British win in a sense, if you want to, if you want to put it that way, which is that Australia opening up uh, access for, for British people under the age of 35 um, for up to three years, removing the previous requirements when it came to farm work, which um, caused quite a lot of issues. So you can really go over to Australia as a young professional. That's creating a great opportunity for Brits in, in vice versa. A lot of Aussies have, have historically, and, and including myself to this day, uh, come over to the UK to work. Um, and I think you're right. This is, a, this is an excellent model. It's, it's not going to have a big impact on the net migration figures since people will be going um, quite substantially both ways. Um, it's something that the, uh, the UK could look at negotiating with um, Canada, uh, it's something that's been talked about as well with New Zealand, or that might be separate, something that could potentially even um, be quite successful with the US. Uh, it does seem like a good way to open up immigration in a less controversial way. And when you look at polling, you get something like 70, 80% of people tend to support um, more open immigration with particularly the Kansas, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and also throw in the US there, if you like, countries. Uh, because we, as you've said, we have similar um, economic levels. It's got opportunity to live in, in somewhere else in the world for a couple of years and, and something that's beneficial to both sides as well. Really, really interesting stuff there. It, it seems that so many parts of this trade deal haven't got that sort of uh, a, a publicity, perhaps, that they deserve. It, it's expected that this, uh, that this uh, vote in Parliament today will go uh, on the side of the trade deal. Uh, of course, the government has a, a, a pretty seismic majority still. Um, and yet, finally in this conversation, what would you say to those sort of voices of opposition, some on the Conservative backbenches, some uh, in the Labour Party, and of course the Green MP as well, who, who, who say that trade is a bad thing. It, are the people that say that trade is actually, you know, good for, for our economy, are we on the back foot? Look, I think we can, we can be on the back foot. You have some people who say trade is only good with the EU. You have other people who say Australia is only good out, uh, trade is only good outside of the EU with other countries like Australia. I think we should be largely universalist in our values and be positive about the potential of these trade deals um, with the UK 
uh, right across the world. And we should remember this isn't just about agriculture. There's a lot more to this deal, as, as I think you're getting there. There's opening up market access when it comes to financial services and telecommunications. There's recognition of uh, professionals. There's a mobility provisions. There's a discussion about investment and digital trade and government procurement and innovation. There's a whole bunch of different sections of this deal. It, we shouldn't, as you've said, just make it about this one issue to do with agriculture and a particular very loud I would say, self-interested lobby group on that side, uh, we should think about the general benefits to the UK economy and, and UK businesses and consumers from the deal. Yes, particularly consumers, given that this cost of living crisis uh, rages on, I would have thought that uh, cheaper food might be a, a benefit mm. to people, but uh, clearly some people disagree. But for now, Matt Lesh, thank you so much for joining us here on The Briefing this morning. Really interesting stuff there. Um, but also today in Parliament, MPs are voting on voter identification regulations. Now, these are plans to require voters to present photo ID at polling stations. The plans have been condemned by some campaigners, while others say they're vital for election integrity. Uh, the Liberal Democrats are attempting to prevent these regulations from becoming law using a parliamentary procedure in the Lords known as a fatal motion. They hope to block the procedure from being introduced in the next uh, May local elections, forcing a vote on the issue in both Houses of Parliament. Well, I'm delighted to be joined now by the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Vince Cable. Uh, and thank you for joining us this morning, Sir Vince. Um, I suppose, first of all, uh, we present identification if we want to buy alcohol. We present identification if we want to open a bank account. We present identification even these days if we want to buy a can of Red Bull. Is uh, the act of voting in an election uh, less serious than any of those things? No, it's, of course it isn't less serious, but, you know, you'd, you'd have to ask the manufacturers of Red Bull why they need identification. <laughs> Um, why is the government, which is generally in favour of deregulation, wanting to bring in new regulation? There have to be good reasons for it. I mean, in the case of, you know, Red Bull, we're talking about alcoholism. If you talk about banks, you're talking about fraud. In this case, there is not a shred of evidence that electoral fraud takes place. There's a lot, a lot of survey work being done to establish if uh, people do impersonate at polling stations, and there's not a shred of evidence to suggest they do. So why introduce new regulation for no reason? I mean, our suspicion is that this is an attempt to suppress the vote or discourage young people from voting, who, generally speaking, don't have uh, a lot of personal uh, documentation, and they're moving rapidly from one uh, private rented accommodation to another. And these are the kind of people who will... Um, either not be allowed to vote or be discouraged from voting. So we, we just see, we question the motives behind it and don't see the justification for it. Aren't young people probably some of the most likely to have forms of identification? Young people are more likely to want to go down to the co-op and perhaps get a, a can of beer or two at the end of a week. I, I mean, the, 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 sort of showing a, a, a provisional driver's licence or, or a passport, or I believe actually in the case of this legislation, there'll be many different forms of ID that people are able to show. It's sort of part and parcel of our lives, isn't it? Well, if, if, it's, if it's very straightforward and there's absolutely no question about, you know, any common sense form of ID being used, then the objections are, are less serious. But my understanding is that uh, as a pensioner, I can take along my um, free pass for transport, but, but student uh, equivalents are not acceptable. Um, and, and if you're going to admit larger numbers of different types of ID, you can imagine the queues that are going to build up at polling stations while people check that all these pieces of, uh, of ID are valid. But, but my, go back to my basic question is, why, why do it? Why is it necessary? We've no evidence that there is a problem here. It's an invented problem mm. for which a solution may possibly discourage large numbers of people from voting. But even if they're not, why have it? You know, why invent regulation for the sake of it? There are one or two cases, albeit small, albeit not particularly large, of, of uh, electoral fraud that do take place each year. Um, I, I suppose the argument is that they're not large enough. But, but when it comes to specific areas, for example, Tower Hamlets, we've seen uh, real examples of, of election irregularity in places 
uh, like that. Uh, is there not a, a case at all for trying to find ways to, to strengthen the democratic processes of this country? Well, it, it doesn't strengthen, it weakens democratic processes if fewer people vote. I don't think the issues around fraud in Tower Hamlets were do, to do with impersonation, which would be stopped by uh, ID. I mean, there, there is a greater opportunity for, for fraudulent activities in postal voting. But again, I think we've all accepted that it's on a sufficiently small scale uh, to keep the, the present system functioning. I mean, the Tower Hamlets case was bad, but it was a very specific case, and it was dealt with. Um, uh, you know, imposing on the whole country, you know, 20, 30 million voters, whoever, it, whoever many people turn out, because of a, you know, a handful of cases in one part of London. It's just egregious nonsense. Well, it'll be a really fascinating debate to follow today in Parliament. Uh, for now, Sir Vince Cable, thank you for joining us on the briefing this morning and talking through those issues. Uh, finally, this morning, the policy exchange think tank have released a flagship report on the so-called Trojan horse affair, when in 2014, Birmingham became the epicenter of a heated debate around secularism and state education. Today's report is the first comprehensive documentation of the key events in Birmingham, including the forced removal of successful secular head teachers, the imposition of segregated classrooms, the reduction of, quote, un-Islamic subjects such as biology, and the promotion of children of extremist views. Well, I'm delighted to be joined now by Dr. Paul Stott, the head of security and extremism at Policy Exchange and co-author of the report. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, first of all, there was a lot of controversy around the Trojan horse affair, allegations of uh, uh, the, the original letter that kicked this all off being uh, somehow fake. Uh, there was a New York Times podcast that accused the whole affair that then the government response to it of being racist. Uh, where do you stand on that? Good morning, Tom. Um, I think it's worth noting with the Trojan horse affair that there were, I think, three investigations that were conducted at the time. And what was found were serious problems within some schools in Birmingham that were attached really to a, to a drive for a sort of Islamization of schools, which had been promoted by some activists and some organizations for many years. The problems actually predate the Trojan Horse Affair. There have been concerns raised before, and indeed some problems in Birmingham schools, opposition to teaching uh, about uh, sex education and homosexuality um, has flared up on, on various occasions. Unfortunately, with organisations like the, the New York Times, they have a, an agenda really at sort of chipping away at uh, issues like this. And over time, the findings from 2014 of the, the different inquiries into Trojan Horse have become rather sort of airbrushed from history, hence the need for our report. And what does your report uncover about the truth of the matter? Because there's been so many different sort of uh, accusations flying uh, from either side on this. Was there a plot to uninstall secular teachers and install sort of Islamist ideology in our state sector? Well, I've spoken quite a bit with Khalid Mahmood, one of the uh, Labour MPs in Birmingham, and he was in regular contact with whistleblowers in Birmingham at the time, who, um, you know, their, their jobs had been made virtually impossible. And Birmingham City Council reached a whole series of, of agreements with people who were, who were basically paid off uh, and uh, had to leave their employment. The types of things going on in the schools uh, are a matter of, of public record. Um, the uh, segregation, uh, increased segregation of, of, of boys and girls, the uh, call to prayer in, uh, in the school playground, uh, a school trip to Mecca, and of course, non-Muslims cannot go to Mecca. So pretty obviously any non-Muslim pupil or staff uh, were excluded. The sort of things that um, really in non-denominational schools uh, appear pretty strange, uh, to say the least. No, really, really interesting stuff there. The call to prayer in... Uh, in secular playgrounds, really concerning. Um, this report 
published by Policy Exchange, is really worth uh, looking at. And indeed, a foreword, if I'm not mistaken, by Michael Gove and Nick Timothy to it. So uh, anyone interested in that can find it online. But, uh, but for now, thank you uh, very much for joining us, Dr. Paul Stott, Head of Security and Extremism at Policy Exchange. That's it for the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Up next, it's Bev Turner today. But first, the weather. Looking ahead to today's weather and the UK is looking cold with low cloud, slow clearing fog and further wintry showers in places. So let's take a look at the details. So it's cold in the southwest today with any mist and fog slow to lift. Best of any sunshine across Devon and Cornwall with cloud lingering in places, especially in the east.